you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show.com. Hey, we're coming here with another great podcast. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Thanks for being here. Be sure to refer the show to your friends, neighbors, relatives. Get them involved. Get them to Google that. Uh, you just go to the iTunes there and you hit the link or you can go to Chris Voss.club and do that as well. You can see the video version of this at youtube.com forward slash Chris Voss. And also you can go to goodreads.com forward slash Chris Voss. You can also see us on Instagram. Twitter, Facebook, tons of groups on LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, just go follow them all, and uh, you'll really enjoy everything you find over there. Today, we have an amazing returning author. She is the author of the newest book that just came out May eighteenth, 2021. The book is called Virus, Vaccinations, the CDC, and the Hijacking of America's Response to the Pandemic. This is going to be pretty interesting. She's been on the show before, Nina Burley. And this episode is brought to you by a sponsor, ifi-audio.com and their micro idsd signature is a top of the range desktop transportable DAC and headphone app that will supercharge your headphones it has two brown burr DAC chips in it and will decode high-res audio and mqa files we're using it in the studio right now i've loved my experience with it so far it just makes everything sound so much more richer and better and takes things to the next level ifi audio is an award-winning audio tech company with one aim in mind to improve your music enjoyment of quality sound eradicate noise distortion and hiss from your listening experience Check out their new incredible lineup of DAX and audio enhancement devices at ifi-audio.com. And uh, Nina is the best-selling author and journalist and lecturer. Her latest book is a brisk real-life thriller that delves into the malfeasance behind the American pandemic chaos and the triumph of science in the area of conspiracy theories and contempt for experts. Uh, so welcome to the show, Nina. How are you? Thank you, Chris. I'm doing pretty well. It's the merry month of May here in upstate New York. Everything's green and I'm sitting outside. So if you could, should hear a, a dog bark, birds tweeting, <clears throat> or a sound of, of a hay truck going by, that's why. There you go. We, it'll give us ambience. People will feel like they're in nature. That's right. Everyone's enjoying outside with the thing. So we had you on your, do you want to plug your last book and then a website for when we had you on last and the website where people can look you up on the web? Yeah, my website is www.ninaburley.com, N-I-N-A-B-U-R-L-E-I-G-H.com. And the last time we talked, Chris, I was promoting the paperback version of my book about the Trump women called The Trump Women, Part of the Deal. And it's a look into the women who are around the former guy and who make their living off the former guy and what they get in return and how his attitudes towards women were shaped by yeah. his father, grandmother, and, and mother. So it's, it's a, a, a book that I think is easily satirized. It could be satir satire at some, po some points. And I had hoped that we wouldn't have to talk about it ever again, but it sounds like the former guy is still around and certainly his his women will outlive him and one of them could pre predict possibly run for office actually we know one of the the, the daughters-in-law is going to run for office mm -hmm. i'm not going to name any of them but you can anyway this, that's the last time you and i talked and and since then i've been up here i left new york city for the pandemic for the lockdown came up to the country here and spent the winter working on a short book about the pandemic, trying to cut through all the fog, panic, and chaos that we experienced where we were in March, April, and May, well, January, February, March, April, and May of last year, and into the summer, really not able to understand what was going on because we were being pelted daily with more astonishing, unbelievable behavior at the top and uh, absence of leadership and 
profiteering. And meanwhile, people were dying left and right. And we were watching scenes that we would never have expected in America, including forklifts moving bodies to refrigerated trucks, large machinery digging trenches for bodies outside of our greatest city, arguably the greatest city in the world. An absolutely unbelievable series of events that I have tried to distill and explain, explain what looked like chaos actually was probably deliberate. Much of what was looked chaotic, looked chaotic was deliberate or, or deliberate negligence. And that book is called Virus. And that's what it's very short. And it's a short, brisk read. I've been told that it reads like a novel. It's not a novel. It's actual fact. And then it, and, and it has to, I also go into the, the science in, in it. So I look Pretty- forward to talking to you about it. Let's do it. Let's do it. You've written a lot of books, actually, haven't you? How many books have you written total? Yeah, this is my seventh. There you go. There I'm you go. not awesome. as prolific as some, but I'm more prolific than others. And uh, yeah, I've been doing this for quite a while. <clears throat> there you go. So you've written the book and you talk about it in five different parts. Let's get into some of the details and I guess start at the beginning or where you start at the beginning of the book. Sure. A little bit of backstory on why the book, why I wrote the book. I had, I was not sitting through the pandemic thinking I'm going to write a book about this. I was writing a bit of journalism here or there and mostly just, I was lucky to be out in the country. I was biking when the the snow came, I was doing a lot of Nordic skiing, but I got a call in and otherwise idling. And, And I got a call in around Thanksgiving from the publisher of Seven Stories Press, which is the publisher that brought the book out. And he said, I want somebody to write a book about the race to the vaccines and what's going to happen with these vaccines. It was before they had really been, I think they were being, beginning to be approved for emergency approval, but nobody had actually had one. And I said, I'm interested in that. I'm interested in science and sci- and I do sometimes write about s- some scientific articles, but I'm also in- interested in the politics and the sociology of what just happened to us. And I, if, I will do this for you if you let me write about what the government did in, with this, in terms of bastardizing the science and trying to p- politicize everything and other things, what happened with this last administration and how they handled it. And then I said, and I, will write, I would also like to write about the proliferation of conspiracy theories, misinformation, disinformation that, uh, that came along with this. So he said, yes, let's do it. So that's the backstory. So I started with, the book starts, opens literally with Donald, the former guy, on March 6th in the CDC in Atlanta. If you remember, he stopped there on his way to, I don't know what he was doing, some rally or something down in Florida. And he took a pit, made a pit stop in Atlanta and he stood in front of the media. And this is in the very beginning when we knew it was starting to infect people in Washington state. We were not all wearing masks yet. There were shortages already of hand sanitizer. You were starting to get that sense of, whoa, like early March. Remember, we were all, whoa, okay, now this is real, but whoa, what's going on? Should we start? People were beginning to prep her up. And here he shows up with his mega hat, big red hat, big guy standing in this lab, and that's where he said, when they were asking him about the cruise ship that was infested and and they weren't letting the Americans off it in in California, that's when he said, I like the numbers low. And of course, that seems to have been one of the, in some ways, the primary goal throughout the administration's response. The other thing that was being discussed there was the test issue. And if you remember again, that, and that, that was at the press conference where he and Alex Azar said, anybody can get a test. They want a test, go get one. And Alex Azar actually said, used the number 4 million. And anybody in New York City at that time, or I don't know where you are, but anywhere where the, it was starting to dawn on everyone that, yikes, we better be starting to get tested because it's starting to come in. You knew you couldn't get a test. You didn't even know where to go. Doctors didn't have it. Nobody knew what to do. And they knew that. They were bald-facedly lying. Mm-hmm. And in fact, the epidemiologist in this, of the CDC, it's CDC's, CDC's ep- epidemiologist, not Redfield, Redfield. the woman that, they, that um, Naomi Wolf, or Naomi Wolf, sorry, not Naomi Wolf. Watts was it who played her or Kidman, Nicole Kidman played her in a movie. She's a virus hunter. She had already testified that week at on the Hill 
that only 3,000 people have been tested in the, in this country of two, 300 million people. And so they were splathering out these lies. And that's where I opened the book. And then I back up and I say, look, so, so, you know, what was going on here? What were, what was the goal? What were, what, what we thought was chaos and mishandling, I always thought from the beginning that it wasn't. And the reason I thought that, Chris, is that I've been, I've covered American politics off and on for a very long time. I've, as I've been in, I'm from Illinois, I started covering state politics. I've covered Washington. I've covered the Trump administration for the last five years up until a year ago. And I really understand the pillars of power that were behind this administration. The misconception is that the rabble was his pillar of power, right? The people who showed up the rallies, the guy with the horns at at one six, like the goofballs, the doofuses with guns. Mm -hmm. And that's that's part of it. But it's not that's not where the poles of power were for him. The poles were two twofold. The evangelical white Christians, the religious zealots who came out to vote and put him in office, he owed them a payback always. And he kept that in mind. And the other poll were, were really the foundation of what, he, what the re- hard right Republican was up to with him in office, which is smash the state, extreme free market, vulture capital, libertarians, mm. heritage foundation people. They wanted yeah. to destroy the ACA. They wanted to absolutely no, no shred of socialism left in our government. No more, ta- you know, no ta- untax everybody. So those are the two polls. And of power. And so with the CDC, what was going on there is they paid back the, they paid back the Christian right by giving them, sorry, there goes the truck, by giving them the public health agencies. Why do they give them the HHS? Because the Christian right cares more about policing morality than just about anything else. And you can do that through public health agencies. And that's what they were doing with the HHS. The first thing they did was take abortion out of all the conversations, put the gag order back on. They put a button on the, you could see it up until Biden came in on the front page of the HHS website. There was a button, religious liberty button. And if you clicked it, you could be You would click it if you were the person who was, let's say, a pharmacist who didn't want to sell contraceptives to women or a doctor or a nurse who didn't want to treat gays or transgenders. That's the religious liberty that they were promoting. So their eye was always on the ball of let's not talk about teen pregnancy in terms of sex education. Let's like re- regress everything back to Victorian Mars or even before and Was their eye on a virus coming from abroad? Heck no. They had no pandemic preparedness going on. The pandemic preparedness community, which is is a terrific community in this country, all of these experts didn't even know who to call in the federal government when they were witnessing what was happening in February and March. And they knew what was coming down the pike and they knew they had a plan. They couldn't get into this or these organizations. These agencies were closed off to them because they didn't have any need for them because they were scorning that kind of expertise because they were all about something else. So that's Mm -hmm. the health side of it. And that's the right wing religious part of it. And that's why he puts, who does he put in charge of COVID, the COVID response, the most zealous religious zealot of them all, Mike Pence. Remember that? Mike Pence, whose record in Indiana was anti-science from day one. He said smoking was good or something like that. Smoking was good. They jailed a woman who had a miscarriage for two years. Wow. That's it was it's unbelievable. So they put him in charge. So I just reminded people of this in my book because people forget it was too many things were happening at once. The other pillar of power within the administration is, of course, the free marketeers, the hardcore the MBAs, the Jared Kushner, I'll trade information with Saudi Arabia if you give me, uh, help me pay for my 666 um, fifth building. Anything goes. That's the type of capitalism that they practice and want. So what happened? As it, they looked at, as this starts to unfold, instead of putting the government apparatus in in gear instead of saying FEMA 
DOD, get out there, get those tests out there. Well, make some tests. Let's take the test that the WHO said we could have and, and put them on every street corner and let's lock down and let's have contact tracing and let's get a cadre of health workers door to door. We can do this, people. We have the, we're the best, biggest, richest country in the world. And we have this apparatus of agencies that we've been putting taxpayer money into. Now's the time to make, put it to use. Instead of doing that, they didn't activate the federal government. They said to the states when, you know, Cuomo needs, they needed PPE and ventilators. He literally said to the governors on a group call shortly after that CDC you know, announcement. I like the numbers low. Well, they went into lockdown on March 11th and then things started to roll fast. At some point after that, he gets on a group call with the governors and they're like, aren't you going to be the sole purchaser for this stuff? The federal government should be the sole purchaser. No, because a sole purchaser means that they can negotiate the price down. That's the whole concept, right? Mm -hmm. FEMA should be buying it. No, we need you to, you can compete with each other for this. So we believe in competition and And he literally said, price is always an issue or always a factor. Like he wanted them to be the highest bidder for the cronies who were going to get the business. Mm -hmm. This is business stepping in and what they needed to, they wanted to show that private enterprise could do a better job than government of running something like this. Mm -hmm. So those are the two things that were behind what we were watching day in and day out in those months of horror going, where's the leadership? What's going on here? Who, what's the federal government? What? They're giving it to the, the states have to fight for it like a video game. They have to. And he's, he's even he would even say things like they have to be grateful to me. He was joking all that. And, and he was getting up on these at these press conferences. And you remember always talking about his ratings. Mm hmm which he did talk about at that CDC press conference. So that's the first chapter. And the, and it ends with, I don't want to give it all away, but it ends with the concept of since nothing was being done, the government wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. There was only one hope, really, and that was to vaccinate everybody. Mm-hmm. And then I go into the, I learned a lot. Of, I did a lot of reading. It was a long winter. I did a lot of reading about history, about vac- vaccinations and where they were invented and who, how they've been used over time and the history of the human science or med- medicine beginning to understand what these little tiny things are that cause illness. Mm-hmm. It's absolutely fascinating to think about, Chris, mm-hmm. that only 200 or 250 years ago, and for every human being before that point in time, so ill millennia of mm-hmm. human species life, we are utterly unprotected against these infectious diseases. Up until about 250 years ago where they realized, oh, the cowpox, a weaker version of smallpox, actually keeps you from getting the smallpox. So let's make everybody get the cowpox. That was the beginning. Mm-hmm. It took another hundred and some years before they understood even what was in there because They didn't have the microscopes. They didn't have Mm -hmm. the eyes on. And then finally, Louis Pasteur and those guys in the late 19th century, mid to late 19th century, start to see, oh, there are these little things. This is what this is. And there was all sorts of controversy about there were deniers. No, it's not that. One, (laughs) once, one, once in front at one European conference in that, at that period when they were just understanding these young, researchers came into a conference and said, we have in this vial, like we know what cholera is now. We figured out it's these little things. We see it. And the, there was an old professor and he was in the room and he, he said, impossible. All illness is caused by co- human constitutions or the miasmas or whatever. They, it has nothing to do with these little creatures. What is this stuff? And he drank the vial before their horrified eyes and they were like, oh, and he's going to die. And miraculously, he survived. Wow. He didn't even get sick. So in a way, he <laughs> showed like, yeah, well, maybe some people's constitutions do not get sick from this stuff. But in any case, there were all these bumps along the way for understanding what made people sick and how to vaccinate people. Oh, and of course, the word vaccine comes from the word cow, vodka. You know, oh, wow. vodka I did not because know cowpox, vaccinia was it's a, it was the, it goes all the way back to Latin and even before that. So I think vodka is the word vosh is the word for cow in uh, French. So 
in the 20th century, we then have these leaps and bounds of vaccine in, in creation. And now, of course, babies are vaccinated like 15 times with different things. In the beginning of the 20th century, in 1900, our great-grandparents were born into a world where um, the average American lifespan was 48 and 49. Now it's, if you're born in 2019, your average lifespan is going to be 80. So it's doubled, right? Why did it double? Why did this number double? One reason is that around the turn of the century, they didn't have antibiotics. So that's one thing. Infections were much more deadly. But children, you would have never gotten, if you were born in 1900, you would never have gotten to like the age of 20 without knowing someone or having yourself been afflicted with some horrendous infectious sickness that would come in waves among children and that no longer we even know how to pronounce. Can you still see me? Because I'm yeah. now losing power. Okay. I might have to go juice this phone up in a bit. So they, they wouldn't have, they would so they, they didn't survive. And now, of course, we don't even know what, to, what these things are called. The vaccines have so changed our society and so changed our attitude towards medicine that we're completely spoiled. We are the most spoiled medically protected generations in human history. So that's one reason why I argue that that these vaccine hesitancy has, is so prevalent because people no longer know what was it that we're we're protected by. So they Mm -hmm. can say, Oh, I'll DIY it. Let me see what it says about the mRNA vaccine on Reddit. <laughs> oh, Reddit, oh, it yeah, might that's... make me sterile. Oh, okay. I better not take it then. Oh, well, I wish it would make some of those people sterile. <laughs> <laughs> right. We don't need them breeding. Yeah, so that's where we're at with that. And and yeah, and then the mRNA, the messenger RNA vaccine itself. <laughs> That's my dog. Sorry. The (laughs) mRNA vaccine itself is a complete medical milestone. It's unlike any of the vaccines before it. We, up until this thing, this platform, everything we were being injected with was based on this platform that they invented in the 18th century, which was Mm -hmm. if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger, which is if you weaken the thing that's the the virus or this infectious element, if you weaken it enough and inject it, the body will recognize it. It won't kill you. And then the real thing comes and it'll, you won't be able to catch it because you'll have antibodies or a response. The mRNA vaccine is completely different. It's a man-made little tiny miracle. It's a bunch of proteins that because we have now electron computers and we can see DNA and RNA and have the protein strands that make up that a virus is made out of, they are able to create this tiny little strand of proteins that they, it's called messenger mRNA because it's transient. It's not Mm. changing your DNA. It's not going in there and altering your body. It's only in there for a reason to tell your cells, make, when you see this shape, make a defense Mm. to it. And so the spiked protein is the D that they've, it shows the cells what the spikes protein looks like. And then it goes away. And then the cells make their own medicine. They make Mm. their own antibodies to this thing. Completely synthetic stuff has been injected to tell it it, and and tell the cells what to do. And the body responds. This is going to change a lot of things. It's already, they had already been working on it for 15 or 20 years and they were applying it to expensive cancer drugs and other drugs for other very intractable diseases and, Mm. and ailments. They had never done it, tried to make a vaccine out of it because partly because vaccines are not money makers yeah. and big pharma is a big part of what's going on here. And they didn't, big pharma was not interested in vaccines because you only use them once and then you're done. And yeah. because so many people are being uh, vaccinated, there's a litigation class action litigation possibility if there's any mistake. So it's yeah. the downside and the upside. They do the math. And so they weren't making a lot of VEX. There were only like seven companies really making vaccines. So the mRNA platform now is going to be used for a lot of things. They will be able to do it when another virus comes along and another virus and another virus. They'll be able to do this very quickly. They had this thing, Chris, they had this design 
three days after the genome was sent over here from China. Yeah. Three days after the Chinese said, here's what this thing is that's killing everybody in Wuhan, they had a design for its response. Three days. And this 11-month period of from knowing that to having it in people's arms is a land speed record. It's never yeah. happened before. Yeah. So, it's like a blueprint, um, isn't it? Where it gives the body a, a blueprint. blueprint and it's goes, a blueprint. Exactly what it is. Yeah. Here's what, the M messenger RNA is just a tiny <laughs> strand of, of proteins that show it's like three different things, proteins. It's very small. And it tells the, it tells the cell when it gets into the cell, it tells the cell and the cell makes a response to it. And Pretty that's why. Yeah, and then the second one is to boost the T cells, which is a whole other thing, which is an extra layer of antibody protection. And that's why it's 95%. It's a man-made miracle. 95%. Yeah. With, uh, we're walking around without masks now. My little local grocery store just stuck mm-hmm. a sign up. I couldn't believe it yesterday saying, CDC guidelines says you don't need a mask in this store if you were vaccinated. And it's weird because you're like, since a lot of people didn't want to wear masks in the first place, how do we know they're vaccinated? Exactly. Yeah. I'm, I don't I'm know. still wearing a mask. I'm not, I'm not getting that stuff in me at all. I get vaccinated. I got my 5G right here. Oh, nice. yeah. I call him. Hey, yeah. Bill, how's the divorce going? Yeah, Moderna, <laughs> babe. But, but yeah, it's really interesting. The Man, what was the question I had for you? I, oh, I'm hoping they can come out with one of these vaccines for stupidity. Like just stupid people. Maybe we can fix that. I'm afraid. I'm afraid we're we're some centuries away from that. Probably. Um, <laughs> if if ever. If ever. So yeah. the next portion of your book, conspiracy theories. You get into why we're conspiracy theories and other things like that. Yeah. Why are we willing to believe? Why are people willing to believe that Bill Gates, the philanthropist behind i don't know how many millions of of vaccinations given Mm -hmm. and lives made better in developing countries is now the villain of this show i i first heard i first encountered this on a reporting trip last summer where i met somebody a scientist actually who shared this theory that the elites are behind this virus they're behind the virus because they understand that Earth can't, can't support the number of human beings on the planet right now. So 80% of us must die. And therefore, they're going to let 80% of the population die in the 20%. And I like, who are those elites? Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Hillary Clinton, the usual suspects, Illuminati, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. It's always yeah. And, and so I get their I heard newsletter. From, I'm in the club. Yeah, me too. So I heard this and I thought, wow, that's interesting. And I'm out here in the middle of the country. And then I started hearing it from more people. And then they threw in the 5G thing. Okay, so why are people so susceptible? Why are we living in this era of QAnon, you know, where our neighbors are believing this stuff? What is going on? And I came to the conclusion that one reason, one theory that I personally uh, believe in is that Our generation, my, okay, I'm at the very end of the baby boom. I like to say that I'm Gen X because I'm right on the cusp and I mentally am more Gen X. I'm not a Beatles, I'm Clash, just for the record. But the baby boom and the CIA are born at the same time, right? Post-war, national security state, metastasizes, security clearances, Lots of secret science starts going on right around that period of time. You get Fort Detrick and the micro, uh, the uh, bioweapons stuff starts in World War II, and then they, they keep going into the 50s. Above-ground nuclear weapons tests, radiation. All the movies when I was a little kid from, were about, like, radiation accidents. Well, Godzilla was a radiation accident. Of course, it was Japan, but the blob. And then we, we were haunted. We are haunted. And then Area 51, which, okay, I don't believe that there are aliens in there. Maybe there are, but I don't think so. But maybe what is there? The question is, what is there? We don't know what's there because it's all this top secret science stuff. So that primed our culture to be very paranoid and very conspiracy minded. And that's I think in a big part of this, I think it's a big part of the vaccine hesitancy, the attitudes towards exper- expertise, and the willingness to believe that, yeah, there is some 
like secret cabals doing secret things and nothing makes sense. We live in a Thomas Pynchon novel or something <laughs> like it doesn't, nothing makes sense anymore. Yeah. You can't, you can see clues everywhere where it's just about decoding. And that's what QAnon is. And it comes, I think, out of this cultural moment that we are in of 60 years of post-war, post-World War II, national security state metastasizing. Yeah. My two Sumerian Huskies are running a cabal in the back of uh, my house. I yeah. know. I, I, you know what they call, they, <laughs> they send messages to me sometimes. Do they? Are they? Yeah. Rocky, knock yeah. it off. Damn it. Anyway, this, sorry, they're yeah. Siberians. They got their minds of their own. But I got another theory. I got a couple theories. One is the crushing of the middle class that's been going on for the last yes. what, 20, 40 years. I, I saw the future of this when I turned 20. Yes. And it was starting to bleed out, was starting to fail. And the trickle down economics did not work, clearly, but twice. Right. And when people reach a point where they're so desperate and they're so broke and nothing's working and all the promises that they thought they were going to have going back to when you and I uh, grew up and you worked for one company for 40 years and you got right. the gold watch and then came the mainstream or uh, not mainstream, but Wall Street destroying everything, the Ivan Bioski attitude. Yeah, just this whole compression and destruction of the middle class where people are just so fucking desperate. They'll believe anything and they'll hold on to any fascist sort of hero like uh, Donald Trump. And then we talked earlier about Strongman, the book by Ruth Bengate, who this is this is how it goes. They crush the society. The society becomes depressed financially, and then they go nuts. So, and then you can also blend in that with how we've been funding trillions of dollars to stupid wars, and and yep. th and the education system has gone to shit. My mom was a teacher for like twenty five years, and for Mine twenty too. years, twenty years, she would tell me, she goes, "We are." these people are getting dumber. We are not educating them. Her class size were doubling and tripling. The Republican yep. legislature Cuts. was constantly taking away money. Yep. I mean, yep. I, she would call me and I, she'd be like, I, I'm, I just spent 250 bucks at the craft store for, for my education. And I'm like, so you get that reimbursed. And she's like, no, mm -hmm. I have to do mm -hmm. that myself. I'm like, mm -hmm. what the hell? Mm -hmm. and she's mm -hmm. like, we are building a dumber society than ever mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I think some of that is that I also yes. wonder as a separate theory, and you may be able to answer this. It's almost like the the God people, the right wing, who got in control of all these the HSS stuff and all that. Like you said, they were changing the lingo and the websites and the education stuff. Mm -hmm. It's almost like they wanted to prove that God could save us. And they're like the Betsy DeVos, the Centers for National Policy, is it? Their whole thing yeah. is to try yeah. and turn us in back into a Bible. Theocracy. A theocracy. Yeah. There you go. Thank yes. you. Yes. And so it's almost like they were like, hey, fuck it. We're going to show you guys how God can save all of you. And then you convert. Yes. I don't know. Yes. I think there's some of that. I think that for those people... Yeah, I think those people do get their kids vaccinated, though. They're not all that far. There are, of course, cults and sects that don't. But I think the run-of-the-mill white evangelical Christian is not necessarily anti-medicine, really. But I, what you're getting at is, and I write about this, I think that this these people, and I'm not talking about the, not so much the white evangelical Christians, but the, the other side, the Bob Mercers, the, the vulture cap, the liber, hardcore libertarian profit, orient, profit over people folks. They're one step away from, eugen, from supporting eugenics. Yeah. They just don't say it, but they will, everything that they support indicates that's what they believe in. For example, they really do think that and Mercer has been like he wants the government shrunk down to a size of a pinhead and any kind of support health care edu free education for the poor is not good because it weak it, it lifts up the weak and the weak will weaken the herd this is the mentality it's Aryan. It's Nazi in, in it's Hitlerian in its essence it's the weakening of the herd the brown the poor so it was okay that this was killing the brown and the poor. And, and I think they did cynically at some point in that administration, some kind of actuarial look. They looked at it and they're like, oh yeah, we can probably absorb 500,000 dead brown people or mostly brown or poor people. That's actually not so bad. Did you? I, remember, I think they really think that way. You probably remember, uh, and it's probably in your book, when Trump just came out and cavalierly went, oh, yeah, yeah, 100, 200,000 dead. We can live with that. 
I don't remember that. That's thank you for reminding me. There yeah. are certain outrages that didn't make it in. If I had to list them all out, <laughs> you'd have a it would have, have been a, a lot longer. Five books. <laughs> <laughs> and I really wanted to keep it short and sweet and to the point. But yeah, yeah, very much. So what do you see looking ahead? It's interesting. I, I don't know if you've seen this graph, but somebody's put out like a little chart thing. And you can see all the states that voted for Biden are all getting vaccinated. The people are getting vaccinated. The disease is dying. And then all these dumbass red states are that didn't vote for Biden, they're not the ones getting vaccinated. And so we have a real problem with this thing going with some sort of viral spin out or like even here in Utah, they're saying that we can't achieve herd immunity because so many idiots don't want the want the thing. Yeah. Yeah. I was true. It's true all over. It's true here in New York City. And in New York City, it's not the yahoos, really. It's the poor blacks or the uh, the brown people who are, un- are turning it down. One, I think one in 10 or two in 10 New York African-Americans are getting the vaccine. There's just, there are just layers and layers of people who are not getting the information about what this is and how good it is or believing it. They're resisting it. So there are lots of different points that they have to come at this from, but I think going forward, look, are we capable of the kind of transformational change where we would say, let's, if this happens again, we'll make billions and billions, no more IP, and we'll just make billions and billions of doses of this and everybody will get it. Probably not. We're not there as a species, but I do think that, and maybe I'm naive, but I do think that the, the other thing about this that is unprecedented in human history is that we were able to see, thanks to these little devices that I'm looking at you in right now, we were able to see in real time that every other human on the planet was experiencing exactly the same thing at the mm. same time. So it's that type of event like climate change. It's a global species-wide situation or an asteroid coming in where you have to like decide what are we going to do or aliens landed. Are we going to be coming together here? Or are we going to be little in little tribes and we're just all going to live or die on our own? And I think says in some ways that might make people more aware of our shared vulnerabilities and then make it, maybe make it more likely that if when another one comes along, the WHO last week said, we recommend X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D, all these things about what we should do next time. And so this doesn't happen the way it worked, played out here. And the WHO was saying, we need more authority to declare pandemic right away, to make travel restrictions right away, to lock down. We need the authority, like this world body needs to be allowed to say and order these things to happen. Of course, you have in part of the right wing support system that Trump was paying back was the anti-world government group. They're so paranoid about Brussels. I actually heard Ingraham, what's her name? Laura, I never watched Fox. I was in a hotel the other night. I literally heard her go, faceless bureaucrats in Brussels are telling us what to do. And I'm like, I think that just he just likes to say Brussels because that like provokes. What is she talking about? Yeah. Who in Brussels is telling us what to do in yeah. America ever? Does but the Federalist that's... Society and, and the Heritage Society just write all her scripts for her shows? That's why I've always wondered. They have to. <laughs> I don't, or, or you know what? They probably don't even have to write them anymore. She can yeah. just, she's like a bot. She just, if you just spew out certain things over and over, you're hitting those points, the people, mm. the pressure points. But anyway, long, the, the who, there should be a world body that everybody agrees upon is going to make some, at least some kinds of recommendations that the countries would follow. Are we, we're fractious, but I don't know. I, I maybe because I'm a Midwesterner and I'm like, must be like, the Pollyanna internal radar is like on hope, <laughs> mm-hmm. but I do think that maybe we, we can learn something from this and that we will learn our shared vulnerability is, is real yeah. and we're reminded of it. We're reminded of it. And we're also, we're reminded of our vulnerability in general. And that makes us more appreciative of science and the experts who we've been scorning or mm-hmm. DIY instead of trusting. There you go. Yeah, hopefully so. I have a saying that I always say that people like. The one thing man can learn from his history is that man never learns from his history. So 
once again, it goes around. And it was interesting, the pandemic 100 years ago, we learned nothing from it. It's still the same thing, yeah, yeah. masks and everything we still aren't getting. So anything yeah. more, Nina, that you want to touch on uh, before we go out? I don't know. I think we've covered a lot, uh, yeah, Chris. Have. I really yeah. appreciate you letting me come on and, and rant and rave about this. <laughs> You're always I do hope that here. everybody goes out and buys my book because it's a good, I think, reminder of some things that people don't know about in terms of vaccines and the history of medicine. That is absolutely fascinating. And we really shouldn't forget, like we forgot the 1919. We really shouldn't forget what happened here? And it's one six probably took the gas out of, I'm actually writing about this right now. One six, I think, took the gas out of the in- inclination to investigate all of this pandemic profiteering and the other things that they did, the outrageous stuff that you and I have just skimmed the surface of, that there would have been an investigation into it had one six not happened. And now it's just going to go, whoever pocketed the millions on those no bid contracts. See you later. Yeah. Jared Kushner was doing all sorts of things with his little Harvard buddies or whatever. And they were trying to, they were trying to figure yes. out a profit. And they're actually stalling our, the government's response because they were trying to figure out how to make some money off of it. It was insane. This is insane. And then yep. it just make, makes me insane is their voters just have no idea how much they're getting played by billionaires. Yep. And, and they're just like, oh, yeah, we don't need unions and we don't need wage increases. We're fine. We've got plenty of nothing <laughs> so there's the ghost so nina it's been wonderful to have you on the show thank you very much for coming on again and sharing Likewise, this wonderful Chris. stuff with us thank, thank you thank you uh guys check out the book virus vaccinations the cdc and the hijacking of america's response to the pandemic you definitely want to read it and make sure that we don't ever do this again commit it to memory if you will just out may 18th 2021 pick up the book at your local booksellers or wherever you buy your fine books go to youtube.com for chess chris foss hit the bell notification button go to goodreads.com for chess chris foss go to facebook twitter instagram all those different places that we publish uh, all of our different things that we do thanks for tuning in stay safe and we'll see you guys next time